The Everlasting Man by G. K. Chesterton Book Two Chapter Three The Strangest Story in the World In the last chapter I have deliberately stressed what seems to be nowadays a neglected side of the New Testament story. But nobody will suppose, I imagine, that it is meant to obscure that side that may truly be called human. That Christ was, and is, the most merciful of judges, and the most sympathetic of friends, is a fact of considerably more importance in our own private lives than in anybody's historical speculations. But the purpose of this book is to point out that something unique has been swamped in cheap generalizations, and for that purpose it is relevant to insist that even what was most universal was also most original. For instance, we might take a topic which really is sympathetic to the modern mood, as the ascetic vocations recently referred to are not. The exaltation of childhood is really something that we can understand. But it was by no means a thing that was then, in that sense, understood. If we wanted an example of the originality of the Gospels, we could hardly take a stronger or a more startling one. Nearly two thousand years afterwards, we happen to find ourselves in a mood that does really feel the mystical charm of the child. We express it in romances and regrets about childhood, in Peter Pan or the Child's Garden of Verses. And we can say of the words of Christ, with so angry an anti-Christian as Swinburne, No sign that ever was given to faithful or faithless eyes showed ever beyond clouds riven so clear a paradise. Earth's creeds may be seventy times seven, and blood have defiled each creed. But if such be the kingdom of heaven, it must be heaven indeed. But that paradise was not clear until Christianity had gradually cleared it. The pagan world as such would not have understood any such thing as a serious suggestion that a child is higher or holier than a man. It would have seemed like the suggestion that a tadpole is higher or holier than a frog. To the merely rationalistic mind, it would sound like saying that a bud must be more beautiful than a flower, or that an unripe apple must be better than a ripe one. In other words, this modern feeling is an entirely mystical feeling. It is quite as mystical as the cult of virginity. In fact, it is the cult of virginity. But pagan antiquity had much more idea of the holiness of the virgin than of the holiness of the child. For various reasons, we have come nowadays to venerate children, perhaps partly because we envy children for still doing what men used to do, such as play simple games and enjoy fairy tales. Over and above this, however, there is a great deal of real and subtle psychology in our appreciation of childhood. But if we turn it into a modern discovery, we must once more admit that the historical Jesus of Nazareth had already discovered it two thousand years too soon. There was certainly nothing in the world around him to help him to the discovery. Here Christ was indeed human, but more human than a human being was then likely to be. Peter Pan does not belong to the world of Pan, but to the world of Peter. Even in the matter of mere literary style, if we suppose ourselves thus sufficiently detached to look at it in that light, there is a curious quality to which no critic seems to have done justice. It had, among other things, a singular air of piling tower upon tower by the use of a, the a fortiori, making a pagoda of degrees like the seven heavens. 
I have already noted that almost inverted imaginative vision which pictured the impossible penance of the cities of the plain. There is perhaps nothing so perfect in all language or literature as the use of these three degrees in the parable of the lilies of the field, in which he seems first to take one small flower in his hand and note its simplicity and even its impotence, then suddenly expands it in flamboyant colors into all the palaces and pavilions full of a great name in national legend and national glory, and then, by yet a third overturn, shrivels into nothing once more with a gesture as if flinging it away. And if God so clothes the grass that to-day is and to-morrow is cast into the oven, how much more? It is like the building of a good Babel tower by white magic in a moment and in the movement of a hand, a tower heaved suddenly up to heaven, on the top of which can be seen afar off, higher than we had fancied possible, the figure of man, lifted by three infinities above all other things on a starry ladder of light logic and swift imagination. Merely in a literary sense, it would be more of a masterpiece than most of the masterpieces in the libraries. Yet it seems to have been uttered almost at random, while a man might pull a flower. But merely in a literary sense also, this use of the comparative in several degrees has about it a quality which seems to me to hint of much higher things than the modern suggestion of the simple teaching of pastoral or communal ethics. There is nothing that really indicates a subtle and, in the true sense, a superior mind, so much as this power of comparing a lower thing with a higher, and yet that higher with a higher still, of thinking on three planes at once. There is nothing that wants the rarest sort of wisdom so much as to see, let us say, that the citizen is higher than the slave, and yet that the soul is infinitely higher than the citizen or the city. It is not by any means a faculty that commonly belongs to these simplifiers of the gospel, those who insist on what they call a simple morality, and others call a sentimental morality. It is not at all covered by those who are content to tell everybody to remain at peace. On the contrary, there is a very striking example of it in the apparent inconsistency between Christ's sayings about peace and about a sword. It is precisely this power which perceives that while a good peace is better than a good war, even a good war is better than a bad peace. These far-flung comparisons are nowhere so common as in the Gospels, and to me they suggest something very vast. So a thing solitary and solid, with the added dimension of depth or height, might tower over the flat creatures living only on a plain. This quality of something that can only be called subtle and superior something that is capable of long views and even of double meanings, is not noted here merely as a counterblast to the commonplace exaggerations of amiability and mild idealism. It is also to be noted in connection with the more tremendous truth touched upon at the end of the last chapter. For this is the very last character that commonly goes with mere megalomania especially such steep and staggering megalomania as might be involved in that claim, this quality that can only be called intellectual distinction, is not, of course, an evidence of divinity, but it is evidence of a probable distaste for vulgar and vainglorious claims to divinity. A man of that sort, if he were only a man, would be the last man in the world to suffer from that intoxication by one notion from nowhere in particular, 
which is the mark of the self-deluding sensationalist in religion. Nor is it even avoided by denying that Christ did make this claim. Of no such man as that, of no other prophet or philosopher of the same intellectual order, would it be even possible to pretend that he had made it. Even if the church had mistaken his meaning, it would still be true that no other historical tradition except the church had ever even made the same mistake. Mohammedans did not misunderstand Muhammad and suppose he was Allah. Jews did not misinterpret Moses and identify him with Jehovah. Why was this claim alone exaggerated, unless this alone was made? Even if Christianity was one vast universal blunder, it is still a blunder as solitary as the Incarnation. The purpose of these pages is to fix the falsity of certain vague and vulgar assumptions, and we have here one of the most false. There is a sort of notion in the air everywhere that all the religions are equal because all the religious founders were rivals, that they are all fighting for the same starry crown. It is quite false. The claim to that crown, or anything like that crown, is really so rare as to be unique. Confucius did not make it any more than Plato or Marcus Aurelius. Muhammad did not make it any more than Micah or Malachi. Buddha never said he was Brahma. Zoroaster no more claimed to be Ormuz than to be Ariman. The truth is that in the common run of cases, it is just as we should expect it to be, in common sense and certainly in Christian philosophy. It is exactly the other way. Normally speaking, the greater the man is, the less likely he is to make the very greatest claim. Outside the unique case we are considering, the only kind of man who ever does make that kind of claim is a very small man, a secretive or self-centered monomaniac. Nobody can imagine Aristotle claiming to be the father of gods and men come down from the sky though we might imagine some insane Roman emperor like Caligula claiming it for him, or more probably, for himself. Nobody can imagine Shakespeare talking as if he were literally divine, though we might imagine some crazy American crank finding it as a cryptogram in Shakespeare's works, or preferably in his own works. It is possible to find here and there human beings who make this supremely superhuman claim. It is possible to find them in lunatic asylums, in padded cells, possibly in straight waistcoats. But what is much more important than their mere materialistic fate in our very materialistic society, under very crude and clumsy laws about lunacy, the type we know as tinged with this or tending towards it, is a diseased and disproportionate type, narrow yet swollen and morbid to monstrosity. It is by rather an unlucky metaphor that we talk of a madman as cracked, for in a sense he is not cracked enough. He is cramped rather than cracked. There are not enough holes in his head to ventilate it. This impossibility of letting in daylight on a delusion does sometimes cover and conceal a delusion of divinity. It can be found not among prophets and sages and founders of religions, but only among a low set of lunatics. But this is exactly where the argument becomes intensely interesting, because the argument proves too much. For nobody supposes that Jesus of Nazareth was that sort of person. No modern critic in his five wits thinks that the preacher of the Sermon on the Mount was a horrible half-witted imbecile 
that might be scrawling stars on the walls of a cell. No atheist or blasphemer believes that the author of the parable of the prodigal son was a monster with one mad idea, like a cyclops with one eye. Upon any possible historical criticism, he must be put higher in the scale of human beings than that. Yet, by all analogy, we have really to put him there, or else in the highest place of all. In fact, those who can really take it, as I here hypothetically take it, in a quite dry and detached spirit, have here a most curious and interesting human problem. It is so intensely interesting, considered as a human problem, that it is in a spirit quite disinterested, so to speak, that I wish some of them had turned that intricate human problem into something like an intelligible human portrait. If Christ was simply a human character, he really was a highly complex and contradictory human character. For he combined exactly the two things that lie at the two extremes. He was exactly what the man with the delusion never is. He was wise. He was a good judge. What he said was always unexpected, but it was always unexpectedly magnanimous, and often unexpectedly moderate. Take a thing like the point of the parable of the tares and the wheat. It has the quality that unites sanity and subtlety. It has not the simplicity of a madman. It has not even the simplicity of a fanatic. It might be uttered by a philosopher a hundred years old at the end of a century of utopias. Nothing could be less like this quality of seeing beyond and all round obvious things than the condi condition of the egomaniac with the one sensitive spot on the brain. I really do not see how these two characters could be convincingly combined except in the astonishing way in which the creed combines them. For until we reach the full acceptance of the fact as a fact, however marvelous, all mere approximations to it are actually farther and farther away from it. Divinity is great enough to be divine. It is great enough to call itself divine. But as humanity grows greater, it grows less and less likely to do so. God is God, as the Moslems say. But a great man knows that he is not God, and the greater he is, the better he knows it. That is the paradox. Everything that is merely approaching to that point is merely receding from it. Socrates, the wisest man, knows that he knows nothing. A lunatic may think he is omniscience, and a fool may talk as if he were omniscient. But Christ is, in another sense, omniscient, if he not only knows, but knows that he knows. Even on the purely human and sympathetic side, therefore, the Jesus of the New Testament seems to me to have, in a great many ways, the note of something superhuman that is, of something human and more than human. But there is another quality running through all his teachings which seems to me neglected in most modern talk about them as teachings, and that is the persistent suggestion that he has not really come to teach. If there is one incident in the record which affects me personally as grandly and gloriously human, it is the incident of giving wine for the wedding feast. That is really human, in the sense in which a whole crowd of prigs, having the appearance of human beings, can hardly be described as human. It rises superior to all superior persons. It is as human as Herrick, and as democratic as Dickens. But even in that story, there is something else that has that note of things not fully explained, 
and in a way here very relevant. I mean, the first hesitation, not on any ground touching the nature of the miracle, but on that of the propriety of working any miracles at all, at least at that stage. My time is not yet come. What does that mean? At least it certainly meant a general plan or purpose in the mind with which certain things did or did not fit in. And if we leave out that solitary strategic plan, we not only leave out the point of the story, but the story. We often hear of Jesus of Nazareth as a wandering teacher, and there is a vital truth in that view in so far as it emphasizes an attitude towards luxury and convention, which most respectable people would still regard as that of a vagabond. It is expressed in his own great saying about the holes of the foxes and the nests of the birds, and like many of his great sayings, it is felt as less powerful than it is, through lack of appreciation of that great paradox by which he spoke of his own humanity as in some way collectively and representatively human, calling himself simply the son of man, that is, in effect, calling himself simply man. It is fitting that the new man, or the second Adam, should repeat in so ringing a voice and with so arresting a gesture the great fact which came first in the original story, that man differs from the brutes by everything, even by deficiency, that he is, in a sense, less normal and even less native, a stranger upon the earth. It is well to speak of his wanderings in this sense, and in the sense that he shared his drifting life, the drifting life of the most homeless and hopeless of the poor. It is assuredly well to remember that he would quite certainly have been moved on by the police, and almost certainly arrested by the police for having no visible means of subsistence. For our law has in it a turn of humor or touch of fancy, which Nero and Herod never happened to think of, that of actually punishing homeless people for not sleeping at home. But in another sense, the word wandering, as applied to his life, is a little misleading. As a matter of fact, a great many of the pagan sages, and not a few of the pagan sophists, might truly be described as wandering teachers. In some of them, their rambling journeys were not altogether without a parallel in their rambling remarks. Apollonius of Tiana, who figured in some fashionable cults as a sort of ideal philosopher, is represented as rambling as far as the Ganges and Ethiopia, more or less talking all the time. There was actually a school of philosophers called the Peripatetics, and most even of the great philosophers give us a vague impression of having very little to do except to walk and talk. The great conversations which give us our glimpses of the great minds of Socrates and, or Buddha or even Confucius often seem to be parts of a nev never-ending picnic, and especially, which is the important point, to have neither beginning nor end. Socrates did indeed find the conversation interrupted by the incident of his execution, but it is the whole point and the whole particular merit of the position of Socrates that death was only an interruption and an incident. We miss the real moral importance of the great philosopher if we miss that point, that he stares at the executioner with an innocent surprise and almost an innocent annoyance at finding anyone so unreasonable as to cut short a little conversation for the elucidation of truth. He is looking for truth, and not looking for death. Death is but a stone in the road which can trip him up. 
His work in life is to wander on the roads of the world and talk about truth forever. Buddha, on the other hand, did arrest attention by one gesture. It was the gesture of renunciation, and therefore, in a sense of denial, but by one dramatic negation he passed into a world of negation that was not dramatic, which he would have been the first to insist was not dramatic. Here again we miss the particular moral importance of the great mystic if we do not see the distinction, that it was his whole point that he had done with drama, which consists of desire and struggle, and generally of defeat and disappointment. He passes into peace, and lives to instruct others how to pass into it. Henceforth his life is that of the ideal philosopher, certainly a far more really ideal philosopher than Apollonius of Tiana, but still a philosopher in the sense that it is not his business to do anything, but rather to explain everything. In his case, we might almost say, mildly and softly, to explore everything. For the messages are basically different. Christ said, Seek first the kingdom, and all these things shall be added unto you. Buddha said, Seek first the kingdom, and then you will need none of these things. Now, compared to these wanderers, the life of Jesus went as swift and straight as a thunderbolt. It was above all things dramatic. It did above all things consist in doing something that had to be done. It emphatically would not have been done if Jesus had walked about the world forever doing nothing except tell the truth. And even the external movement of it must not be described as a wandering in the sense of forgetting that it was a journey. This is where it was a fulfillment of the myths rather than of the philosophies. It is a journey with a goal and an object, like Jason going to find the golden fleece or Hercules, the golden apples of the Hesperides. The gold that he was seeking was death. The primary thing that he was going to do was to die. He was going to do other things, equally definite and objective, we might almost say equally external and material. But from first to last, the most definite fact is that he is going to die. No two things could possibly be more different than the death of Socrates and the death of Christ. We are meant to feel that the death of Socrates was, from the point of view of his friends at least, a stupid muddle and miscarriage of justice interfering with the flow of a humane and lucid, I had almost said a light, philosophy. We are meant to feel that death was the bride of Christ, as poverty was the bride of St. Francis. We are meant to feel that his life was in that sense a sort of love affair with death, a romance of the pursuit of that ultimate sacrifice. From the moment when the star goes up like a birthday rocket to the moment when the sun is extinguished like a funeral torch, the whole story moves on wings with the speed and direction of a drama, ending in an act beyond words. Therefore, the story of Christ is the story of a journey, almost in the manner of a military march, certainly in the manner of the quest of a hero moving to his achievement or his doom. It is a story that begins in the paradise of Galilee, a pastoral and peaceful land, having really some hint of Eden, and gradually climbs the rising country into the mountains that are nearer to the storm clouds and the stars, as to a mountain of purgatory. He may have met, he may be met, as if straying in strange places, or stopped on the way for discussion or dispute but his face is set towards the mountain city. That 
is the meaning of that great culmination when he crested the ridge and stood at the turning of the road and suddenly cried aloud, lamenting over Jerusalem. Some light touch of that lament is in every patriotic poem, or if it is absent, the patriotism stinks with vulgarity. That is the meaning of the stirring and startling incident at the gate of the temple, when the tables were hurled like lumber down the steps, and the rich merchants driven forth with bodily blows. The incident that must be at least as much of a puzzle to the pacifist as any paradox about non-resistance can be to any of the militarists. I have compared the quest to the journey of Jason, but we must never forget that in a deeper sense it is rather to be compared to the journey of Ulysses. It was not only a romance of travel, but a romance of return, and of the end of a usurpation. No healthy boy reading the story regards the rout of the Ithacan suitors as anything but a happy ending. But there are doubtless some who regard the rout of the merchants and money changers with that refined repugnance which never fails to move them in the presence of violence and especially of violence against the well-to-do. The point here, however, is that all these incidents have in them a character of mounting crisis. In other words, these incidents are not incidental. When Apollonius, the ideal philosopher, is brought before the judgment seat of Domitian and vanishes by magic, the miracle is entirely incidental. It might have occurred at any time in the wandering life of the Tianian. Indeed, I believe it is doubtful in date as well as in substance. The ideal philosopher merely vanished and resumed his ideal existence somewhere else for an indefinite period. It is characteristic of the contrast, perhaps, that Apollonius was supposed to have lived to an almost miraculous old age. Jesus of Nazareth was less prudent in his miracles. When Jesus was brought before the judgment seat of Pontius Pilate, he did, he did not vanish. It was the crisis and the goal. It was the hour and the power of darkness. It was the supremely supernatural act of all his miraculous life that he did not vanish.